Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to lunch with you. Um, I appreciate being here, and I uh, appreciate your interest in my book, which uh, is titled The Curse, Big Time Gambling Seduction of a Small New England Town. And uh, the book begins uh, way back in the 1600s with the Pequot War when uh, Connecticut colonists living up and down the Connecticut River got together with the Mohegan tribe and almost destroyed the Pequots as an Indian tribe. And the story then jumps some 350 years as these two tribes, the Mohegans and the Pequots, reemerge almost miraculously to build the world's two biggest casinos in southeastern Connecticut. And in the book, uh, which as I say is a novel, a fictional Connecticut family becomes embroiled in a battle to stop a third casino that threatens the family's town and ancestral home. So there you have in a nutshell the, uh, the story. It is, uh, is meant to put a human face on uh, what occurred in southeastern Connecticut, and uh, I hope uh, I've uh, accomplished that. What I'd like to do this afternoon, uh, and I know I don't have a lot of time, but uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the background to the book rather than the book itself. Um, because the book is based on fact, and that factual background is what I think you'd really be interested in. I should probably start, however, by giving you just a little bit of my own background. Uh, I represented Eastern Connecticut, which is almost all of Connecticut, east of the Connecticut River, in Congress during the 1970s. And uh, in uh, the mid-1970s, I left office to run for governor of Connecticut unsuccessfully. And at that point, I left, Con I left uh, Congress, and I left politics, and my wife and I and our four children moved from Vernon, which is just east of Hartford, uh, down to Ledger, Connecticut where we lived for some 21 years, literally on the edge of the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation. And those two experiences, having served in Congress and knowing, so to speak, the political environment of Eastern Connecticut, as well as I did, and then uh, living in the midst of Southeastern Connecticut, two together really gave me the equivalent of a front row seat for seeing the political maneuverings that led to the casinos and then seeing their impact. While the proposal here in Milford for a casino is not for an Indian casino per se, uh, nonetheless, I think it'd be worth noting the role of Indian casinos in opening the door to casino gambling across the country and to the kind of casino gambling that's now spreading into Massachusetts. Uh, Indian casinos got their start back in 1988 when Congress passed something called the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which was meant to help poor, federally recognized Indian tribes build casinos on their reservations in order to raise money for their tribal governments. It'd be fair to say, however, that Congress had absolutely no idea of the Pandora's box it was opening when it passed this law. As it turned out, the law not only opened the door to Indian casinos, but it also spurred the legalization of non-Indian so-called commercial casinos uh, in state after state, leading to a dramatic increase in the amount of casino gambling in the United States. Back in 1988, only two states allowed casinos. Of course, they were Nevada with Las Vegas and New Jersey with Atlantic City. Today, 39 states allow casinos, and the country is awash in casinos. We now have almost 1,000 of them, almost evenly divided between Indian casinos and commercial casinos, few less Indian casinos than commercial casinos. As a result, casino gambling has literally become America's new national pastime, with more people going to casinos than to professional baseball, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, and you can throw in any other professional sport you're aware of combined. That's how big it's become. 
Moreover, the recession that we're all going through has led to a whole new round of, ex of casino expansion, with state after state, like Massachusetts, looking to casinos for additional revenue. New casinos are popping up, it seems, just about everywhere. Um, from a shopping mall, for example, in Maryland, just opened. It's, uh, it's the first one in a big mall in the United States. Uh, to a former department store in downtown Cleveland. To an old Bethlehem steel plant in Pennsylvania. And in the city of Chicago, the mayor of Chicago, whom, as you know, is the former chief aide to the president of the United States, has recommended that the city of Chicago uh, build, own, and operate a casino of its own so it can funnel money directly from the citizens of Chicago into the uh, city treasury of Chicago. Nowhere in the last 25 years, however, has casino gambling gotten off to a more spectacular start than in Connecticut. Foxwoods opened back in 1992, and Mohegan Sun followed just four years later in 1996. They were the first casinos in the Northeast, or I probably should say legal casinos in the Northeast, other than in Atlantic City. And with no other competition, they quickly grew into the two biggest casinos on the planet. Drawing some 55 to 60 percent of their customers from out of state, mainly New York and Massachusetts, creating some 20,000 casino jobs, and sending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the state treasury in Hartford. Now, Massachusetts officials have repeatedly cited these spectacular numbers in making the case for legalizing casino gambling uh, here in the Bay State. But one wonders how closely Massachusetts has looked at the downside of Connecticut's casinos, and especially what has been happening in Connecticut lately. The casino's presence in southeastern Connecticut has created a pervasive gambling culture in the region. They've skewed the region's economy sharply toward low-paying service jobs, and they've been followed by a sharp spike in the number of pathological gamblers who, incidentally, are increasingly uh, 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 getting treatment at various state-supported uh, uh, facilities. Traffic overwhelmed the local roads in southeastern Connecticut. Drunk driving arrests in Norwich, the nearest big city, more than doubled. And in order to handle the influx of immigrant workers attracted to uh, uh, casino jobs, the Norwich school system had to create an English for speakers of other languages, or as they called it, ESOL program, for some 400 students who collectively spoke 27 different languages. One of the most remarkable findings of a 2009 state-sponsored study was that since Foxwood had opened, there had been a 400 percent increase in the number of arrests for embezzlement in southeastern Connecticut, a rate of increase 10 times the national average. Uh, indeed, uh, my tax collector in Ledger was one of those embezzlers. She stole $302,000 from tax receipts in order to play the slots at Foxwoods. And of course, she didn't win. The New London Day, which is our biggest newspaper, uh, saw what was happening and described Eastern Connecticut as the new embezzlement capital of America. Now, according to the National Council on Problem Gambling, about three million American adults are pathological gamblers. That is, they cannot control their gambling at all. Although, while another six to nine million have lesser, but nonetheless very significant, gambling addictions. And another 15 million adults are at risk for becoming addicted as gambling opportunities continue to spread. As far back as 1997, Congress, after having opened the door to uh, uh, nationwide uh, uh, casinos, Congress became so concerned about the spread of legalized gambling and its social costs that it set up a national commission to study the problem. The commission recommended that there be a, a it took two years to do this study, but in any event, uh, after two years, it recommended, based on its findings, that there be a moratorium in the opening of new casinos until the government could get a better handle on the costs. The recommendation, however, was never implemented, and as I've suggested, this number of casinos have continued to multiply. 
In the meantime, the casino industry and casino opponents have fought what I would call a pitched battle over whether or not casinos are good or bad for our society. The casinos, which have now become a $63 billion industry and one of the most powerful political groups in the United States, argue that casinos spur economic development, create jobs, increase uh, entertainment options, and uh, supply municipalities and states with much needed revenue. Opponents, however, as you would suspect, take a very opposite view. First, they argue that gambling is addictive for millions of people. The casinos prey on problem gamblers who can't control their gambling for a major part, and in many cases, a majority of their income. And that uh, gambling addiction leads to debt, bankruptcies, broken families, and crime. They're especially critical of slot machines, which typically produce 75 to 80 percent of a casino's revenue, and are viewed as the most addictive form of casino gambling. In fact, a new book titled Addiction by Design, and the title kind of gives it away, by a brilliant MIT professor by the name of Natasha Schull, who's recently on uh, 60 Minutes uh, on a, a feature on this book. Uh, in the book, she makes the case that slot machines have been engineered to be far more addictive than most people previously realized. The book documents in dramatic detail uh, how today's slots are the uh, uh, are the result of exhaustive corporate research into how to keep people gambling as long as possible, how to, how to increase what the industry calls time on device in order to extract maximum profit from each player. Second, opponents contend that individuals aren't the only ones becoming hooked on gambling. In addition, they say state governments are becoming so dependent uh, on gambling revenue that they become partners of the casinos, often more concerned about the casino's health than the health of their own constituents. Third, opponents say that casinos constitute a regressive tax on low-income people who can afford the losses the least. Fourth, they reject the idea that casinos are effective economic development tools. In Connecticut's case, they point out that casinos have done little, if anything, to create spin-off businesses. But instead have cannibalized existing businesses and left people with much less money to spend than they would on local goods and services than they would have otherwise. As one local restaurant owner uh, uh, said, uh, and I think he described it uh, best, visitors drive to the two casinos, they play at the casinos, they eat at the casino restaurants, they stay at the casino hotels, they fill up their tanks at the casino gas stations, and they drive home. And finally, opponents of casinos say there is very little evidence to suggest that casinos ultimately strengthen a state or a region's finances. Connecticut, they note, has taken in over $6 billion now since 1992, during the last 20 years, yet has the highest debt and unfunded liabilities relative to GDP of any state in the nation. Moreover, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis recently absolutely jolted all of us in Connecticut by reporting that Connecticut was the only state with negative economic growth in 2012. Economist Earl Grinnells, who is probably the leading expert on the impact of casino gambling uh, on a community, goes so far as to estimate that the long-term costs from introducing a casino into a region including both the social cost and lost productivity, actually outweigh the benefits by at least three to one. Now, the cost to benefit ratio in Connecticut has presumably been considerably more favorable than that because of the success Connecticut's two casinos have had in attracting out-of-state gamblers who, of course, leave their money in Connecticut. But the question now is how long that success will continue as Connecticut becomes and uh, indeed the whole country becomes increasingly saturated with casinos and Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun increasingly lose this monopoly that has allowed them to draw all these people in from other states and clearly that monopoly is ending. 
Maine now has its first two casinos. Rhode Island, as you know, just finished just in the last two weeks converting one of its two slots parlors, the one in Lincoln, Rhode Island, into a full-scale casino. Uh, New York, uh, which already allows extensive, massive uh, electronic casino-type gambling at all of its racetracks, is in the process of amending its state constitution to permit the building of up to seven new casinos, full-scale commercial casinos, across New York State. And of course, here in Massachusetts, you're in the process, I don't need to come to Milford to tell you this, <laughs> in the process of selecting sites for its three casinos, and I don't want to leave out the slots parlor, which if history is any, any guide, will soon become a casino once it is built. As a result of the recession and growing competition, especially from Rhode Island and Yonkers and Aqueduct racetracks in New York, Connecticut's slot revenue is already down 32%. That's the latest figure I have from its peak. With the state government share falling from $430 million in 2007 to under $300 million today. Layoffs, I'm sure as you know, at both casinos have begun. And Foxwoods is deeply in debt due to massive overexpansion. The same downward trend has begun in other northeastern uh, casino markets, and is particularly advanced in Atlantic City, where the recession and growing competition from Pennsylvania and other states have cut casino revenue by more than 40 percent. Just three months ago, Atlantic City's newest and grandest and greatest, most spectacular resort casino, the Revel, or as they call it simply, Revel, uh, opened in April of 2012 put $2.4 billion in it because everybody was so optimistic. In March of this year, it filed for bankruptcy protection. Just one more casualty for a community that bet heavily on casino gambling. Uh, and as one New Jerseyite, now actually lives in New Hampshire, put it, he said, when they came to us with casinos, with the idea for casinos in Atlantic City, and these were his words, and I have to repeat them because I don't see how anybody could, uh, could uh, couch them any better. He said, they promised us a sparkling gem. He said, instead, what we got was a glitzy strip surrounded by a slum. Now, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun obviously are run by professional people. Uh, and they brought people in from all over the country to run the casinos. And they say they have no intention of sitting around and letting all this competition eat their lunch. What they intend to do is upgrade their properties and re-emphasize through their marketing campaigns their role as destination resorts, uh, offering a broad range of attractions and other kinds of amenities in order to get people from out of state to continue to come to Connecticut. But I think you'll probably agree with me that it's unlikely that many Bostonians or New Yorkers who want to gamble are going to continue getting in their car and driving all the way to eastern Connecticut to gamble when they've got a brand new state-of-the-art casino in their own back backyard. Instead, it seems likely that Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun will have to increasingly turn inward and depend more and more on attracting more and more local people to gamble in order to fill up the gambling facilities they've created. And that, of course, means more social problems for us in Connecticut. Now, some of you sitting around the table uh, this afternoon may say, well, you know, too bad for Connecticut. But it's difficult to believe that your experience here in Massachusetts is going to be any different. Massachusetts new casinos may choose to call themselves destination casinos or destination resorts. But the truth is that almost all casinos outside of Las Vegas appear destined to become mainly convenience casinos for local people because of all the competition. You don't have to travel anywhere. As a result, most casinos here in Massachusetts can expect the great majority of their customers will come from close by except from other, rather than from other places in New England uh, or outside the region. There's also another very important uh, lesson that we're just beginning to learn in Connecticut that Massachusetts may want to take a look at. 
And that is, once the casino revenue starts dropping, as it is in Connecticut, you can expect your state to try to replace the, uh, the revenue, the disappearing revenue, by encouraging more gambling, not less, more gambling. And that, incidentally, is precisely what is happening in other states as well. In Connecticut, the state's response to declining casino revenue has been to increase the casino's free play allowance so the casinos can beef up promotions and entice more people to come on in and gamble. And the state has begun moving aggressively to put the state itself in the casino gambling business. For starters, the state legislature used a late night session just four weeks ago in Hartford uh, in order to sneak in a bill legalizing Keno. I know you have Keno here in Massachusetts, but we never had it in Connecticut. And the polls show people are overwhelmingly opposed to it in Connecticut. But in any event, we are going to get it in restaurants, bars, taverns, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and the legislature also made a secret deal with the tribes to give the tribes 12.5% of the winnings uh, from Keno uh, 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 rather than uh, face any kind of uh, uh, court fight with the tribes over who gets the money. Then a day later, key legislators in Hartford proposed legalizing slots, or rather I should say video slots, at Bradley Teletheater in Windsor Locks, at Sports Haven in New Haven. If you pass through New Haven, you can't miss Sports Haven. Uh, and at the former dog track in Bridgeport, which incidentally had to fold uh, because it didn't have enough customers. Um, and that would require additional profit sharing with the two tribes and lead to the spread of state-run slot parlors in other locations all over the state of Connecticut. All of these moves pale, however, compared to what our representatives in Connecticut appear to have in store for us next. Nevada and New Jersey recently, just a little earlier this year, approved internet gambling for their casinos. And Connecticut's governor is on record as saying that if other states allow internet gambling for their casinos, Connecticut should legalize online gambling for Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun to enable them to keep up with the competition. We've got to defend our two casinos, the governor told the Hartford Current last year. They are our strength. We have to build them up. In other words, having brought physical casinos into the state of Connecticut back in the 1990s, there's now uh, a situation where we face growing pressure to add internet gambling, which the casinos want, and I guarantee yours will want, as soon as possible in order to attract a much younger audience. And which the experts say is particularly addictive because of the fast pace of the games, their 24-hour availability, and the instant gratification aspect of online play. As one observer put it, legalizing online gambling would be the equivalent of opening a 24-hour casino in every house, apartment, and dorm room in the state. The further potentially massive expansion of casino-type gambling in Connecticut is a daunting prospect for those who think we already have enough gambling in the state. In fact, the entire ongoing story of casino gambling in Connecticut is enough to want to write a book. Thanks very much. We're familiar with casinos in eastern Connecticut. We have two. We feel fortunate we have two casinos owned by local people, essentially. They're both tribal nations. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> And in that sense, we are lucky, and I, I, I mean that sincerely, because we have, they're owned by people who was, were born and brought up in the community and who had a vested interest, went to the local schools. Um, the Mashantuckets came first. They were the first to get recognized. And um, in those days, <clears throat> they had a right to, be, uh, to run a bingo hall. And as a young person, I remember when I was just getting involved in politics years ago, we'd go over there for a fundraiser for our local congressman or senator at the bingo hall because it was the biggest building in the area. But it was way to hell out to nowhere. I mean, it was in, a, in those days that none of the area was developed. So um, eventually a fellow like, uh, by the name of Skip Hayward, who was a devoted Native American, devoted, I mean, to his culture, um, followed up and 
I guess, became aware, I'm not sure how, but became aware that he could expand the facilities. And I was, as first selectman, I attended the opening ceremony. They were supposed to be opened from um, 7 in the morning till 2 in the morning. But the, they couldn't empty the place out, so they never closed, and they haven't been closed since. Um, it's, a, it's a great success story from a rags to riches kind of story. I mean, these people, they've had, their, they've had their difficulties, and, you know, I'm frank about that too. I mean, I'm not here to sell them or anybody else, but they've had their difficulties. Uh, they're an organization that became quite wealthy overnight, and that brings along, as we all know, certain difficulties that they have to adjust to, and they did, and they, they are and have done a good job overall adjusting to the newfound wealth and uh, successes. They've been open now 20 years. <coughs> and um, then along came the Mohican Sun. They've been open now, I think, about 12 years. Um, another f fine group of people. I mean, you could not meet nicer people. They, again, went to the local schools. They grew up in in, in um, literally severe poverty. I mean, there weren't, there weren't um, well-off people by any stretch of the imagination. <coughs> when I was first selectman, <coughs> a fellow by the name of Ralph Sturgis used to stop in to see me. He lived not too far away from the town hall, and he'd stop in and he'd chat, and he kept telling me that he's a real Indian. Well, you know, I grew up in Ireland, and we had one TV in the town, and I used to go into the town, myself and a bunch of other kids, and watch the Lone Ranger in Tonto. And this guy didn't look anything like Tonto. And, but it was my first introduction to a Native American. And uh, I, I say that with complete sincerity. He, he is, and was, he's dead now, one of the nicest individuals I've ever run into totally sincere down to earth and uh, even when he became wealthy and very wealthy there was nothing assuming about him in fact i'll tell you a kind of a funny story i'm now fast forward many years i'm now head of the chamber and we wanted to honor him as citizen of the year it's a big event we have usually anywhere between five and seven hundred people show up for dinner and so <clears throat> we selected Ralph Sturgis. He's now in his 80s. And um, the tribal council, I called up the head of the tribal council and I said, you know, we've selected Ralph. He was chief for life. That was a, an honored position in the tribe. And again, a very devoted Native, Native American could, could speak the language. I mean, he was really, um, his whole family was actually very involved in their own culture. So we, the chief says, oh, the head guy said, don't worry, we'll get him there. We'll send a limousine <clears throat> and pick him up. So, which I thought was a good idea because the man was quite elderly and our office was in a little bit of a difficult place to get to. The limousine arrived at 10 in the morning. Ralph got furious at them, sent him off. He says, I'll drive myself. He had a little Ford car he had for years. Well, he lost himself. He got lost in the process. So we're all with the press. We're waiting there with some of the local politicians. Where is Ralph? Well, no one knew where Ralph was. So <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, he finally, we finally discovered. He went home, and they finally got him there. But the nicest person in the world. and. Uh, that you couldn't meet nicer. In fact, my brother has a big photograph of him in full regalia. In his, he owns a nursing home in Ireland, in the main entrance of the nursing home. So everyone who goes in there wants to know who this Indian is, and uh, it's it's a great story. But anyway, sorry, I'm getting carried no, away here. <clears throat> but I'm trying to give you a sense of who we deal with. They've always had a keen interest in the community, and it has it's genuine. It's genuine. It's not because they're well off. They had, they, were, they had a keen interest when they were poor. They got involved in various programs. In fact, the chief, the woman who took over from Ralph Sturgis, and my wife is, um, well, I better not go there. <coughs> uh, 
Um, the woman who took over from Ralph is, I be we believe, one of the first chiefs of a Native American tribe in the country. But we're not 100% certain about that. That's going to be told, that story has to be told yet. But she is a local RN. She worked in the local hospital as a nurse her entire life. In fact, up until recently, still worked there. Did not take advantage of their newfound riches in terms of, and she could be in any position that's, you know, quite frankly, um, in, in the um, governance of the tribe. But she loved her nursing and uh, she was there, I think, until about a year ago, maybe two years at the most, as an RN. She's now retired. They have been engaged in the local community in a whole variety of levels, whether it's the Board of Education, whether it's the um, various political positions and non-political positions. They have been extremely generous with their funding. Um, their belief is that if they're doing well, you should be doing well. I mean, that's kind of their philosophy. I would venture to say, and uh, you can probably check this out for yourselves, but there are very few legitimate organizations that ever went to either of the tribes over the years that if their cause was reasonable at all, there were, I'd say there were very few that's ever been refused. And of course the request has to be reasonable. But like I say, they're generous. Look, I can talk for hours about them, but um, I've read up, I mean, I've always had a keen interest in Native Americans just because of um, where I was born and brought up. We didn't have anybody but Irish there, and they can be very boring at times, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so what do you guys, what do you folks do? I mean, you have, a, you, have, you have a situation on your hands. You have to make a decision. I mean, you know, it's, um, you can say no or you can say yes. That's really, the, there, those are the two choices you have. The thing I would say is look into the facts. Don't listen to people who really don't know what they're talking about. Go to the people who do know, who have some experience, like myself and there's dozens of other people. I'll give you a list of people you can call on that have dealings with them. Find out for yourself. <clears throat> Both tribal nations employ about 20,000 people in the region. You know, they're not, a lot of the jobs are not ones I'd want. But let me tell you, they're ones I did. I was damn pleased to have them when I needed them. And um, I'm not above working at anything when I need to. And quite frankly, um, I look around this room, uh, we all have some gray hair, maybe you don't. <laughs> You're the question. So, <laughs> but we have young people who need to work. They need to get a start in life. It doesn't have to be the job they have for life, but they have to have work. And so if you're not bringing in other industry, you need to think about this as an option. Look, and I'm happy. I can live the rest of my life and get along fine. And I imagine most of you people here can also. But you know, think back when you were young. You wanted a job. You needed a job. So you have to get that start. So if we're not providing jobs elsewhere, it's not like years ago what I did in Ireland, I emigrated. I went to England at age 14 to get enough money to come over here to pay my way. You can't do that here. Where are you going to go to? Young people have to have work. Sir, if I, if, I, if I may ask a question. I understand there's 20,000 people employed, 10,000 or so between each uh, casino, however you want to divide it. Roughly. I guess the, the local concern for businessmen and women are whether or not those jobs are at the cost of their business. Are their businesses <coughs> going to be closing? There seems to be an impression, in my opinion, a misimpression uh, as there's been literature being mailed out, the business is closed, it was bad for uh, small business. We, everybody here, or most everybody here is in a small business. And to that extent, we want to make sure that we all survive and thrive in, in the economy. So 
do you believe that there has been a negative impact on small businesses in eastern Connecticut where the two casinos exist? If someone is spreading that rumor, it's an absolute bold-faced lie. They, they are definitely spreading that rumor. Yeah. It's a lie. <laughs> it's I, not I true. <laughs> They're definitely saying that. I, I'm receiving <laughs> literature that yeah. says that. Well, it's a lie. It's as simple as that. We've just gone through, what, a five-year recession? We haven't finished it yet. We're, not th we're, we're still kind of in it. We're coming out of it slowly. Just this year, a brand new Hilton Hotel was opened up down the road from Foxwoods. Now, do you think these people are so stupid to open up a hotel and not be successful? I mean, their research tells them that they're going to make money. Well, they wouldn't have done it. These are smart investors. What's happened? Will there, you know, let me, let me tell you what I think is you, people may be misreading. Will there be adjustments? Yes. We had terrible restaurants in eastern Connecticut up until the casinos came. But when they came, they brought in chefs from all over the country, top chefs who had slowly decided they didn't want to work for the casino anymore and they went outside and they opened up their own restaurant and became very successful in their own businesses. You know, the, wor the world is not going to stand for anybody. There will be change, but it will be positive change. Now, that's our experience. I, I can only tell you what's our experience and that's the truth.